thanks everyone for waiting it out until the last talk um, of the day. Um, I know everyone's looking forward to lunch and going to the Mall of America for this SpongeBob roller coaster. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but this is the last talk. Um, I'm really excited about this. Um, if you don't know what you're here for, I'm talking about a new file format for OpenStreetMap I'm working on called OSM Express. Um, there's a GitHub link, it's all open source. Um, to introduce myself, I'm Brandon. Um, I'm working on something new called ProtoMaps, which is kind of an open source mapping lab. Um, it has a website that you can go to. Um, but I want to talk about my motivation for creating a new file format. Um, and it comes from sort of the nature of OpenStreetMap, which is that um, we love to edit the map. We love to put data in. There's always data flowing in every minute, every hour, every day. There's mapping events that go in. Um, so once we put in all that data into OpenStreetMap, we love to download it and consume it. Um, you know, there is an OpenStreetMap website. You can see um, like tiles online, um, but really like the act of consuming OpenStreetMap is pretty tricky. Um, it's like, do we love to download a 46 gig file that's updated once a week? Um, Cause that's sort of the canonical store for OpenStreetMap um, is as the PBF or the XML dump. Um, and um, I think like this file format, which is OSM PBF, um, it's great, it's really useful. Um, it's really interoperable. Like most tools like um, sort of uh, these conversion tools um, or even like routing engines, they take a PBF file as input. Um, and it's great for archiving and transmission because it's so small. Um, it has a lot of custom compression built in. Um, but there is some issues with it um, that are sort of a compromise. Um, there's no random access to an object inside of a PBF file. Um, like you can't say, I only want this ID in the file. You have to run through the entire thing from start to end. Um, there's also no spatial access. So if you have a PBF file of the entire planet and you only want one small part like Minneapolis, you have to run through the entire file. Um, and this is um, just true because of that design of the PBF file. Um, also, if you want to update it, like if there is um, these diffs online for each minute of changes, you can't apply them to the, like you're not able to apply them in place to the PBF file. Like it also requires rewriting the entire file. Um, and also if you wanted to construct a geometry from objects, that requires random access. So like PBF is, is really widely used and is really compact, but it's not that flexible if you actually want to use it. Um, so when I describe this problem of getting minutely updates and random access over an OSM PBF, people say, oh, just do your updates in Postgres. Um, people use things like OSM to PGSQL. That tooling is really mature. Um, and it's powerful, it has spatial queries, um, but fundamentally it's always going to be a lossy transformation of OSM data. Um, it's always going to be turning like ways and nodes and relations into geometries. Um, you, you often lose some of the tags um, if you um, transform them into a schema. Um, Postgres is also pretty complicated, like I don't know how many sort of sysadmins are out there, but it has an authentication layer built in, it has its own wire protocol, um, has multiple processes that need to run, and it's not so easy to move around between machines. Um, there's another really good tool out there uh, that everyone loves um, and is really useful, um, it's Overpass. Um, so it solves some of those lossy problems in that it's specific to the OSM data model. Um, it's really powerful for interactive queries, even through the web with something like Overpass Turbo. Um, there, are, there are some limitations that I want to address in Overpass um, that are kind of because it's so powerful. Um, it's quite memory hungry for huge areas over about 50 or 100 million nodes. Um, it has um, some operational complexity because of all of its features. Um, you know, it has um, its own language and a parser for that, um, a, like an interpreter and a dispatcher process. Um, so um, I'm like trying to find something in this, um, in this design space um, that is as simple as possible. Um, and I know there's some other libraries out there. There's something called OSM lib, which is pretty similar um, in design. Um, if you use imposim3, um, there's a level DB cache it uses for resolving geometries. Um, so I'm like kind of looking at tools in that vein um, that might be able to do even more. Um, so my primary goals for creating a new file format are random ID access. Um, so you can look up things by node ID, way relation, or node, way or, that relation ID, and also spatial access. You should be able to 
write a really fast query that runs over one small area in the file. And I also want to support fast minutely updates, so you're able to consume changes from osm.org as soon as they appear. Um, stretch goals, um, it would be even better if the entire database was a single file. That means you could copy it from, let's say, your laptop to a server really easily. Um, it'd be really nice if this database had a single code path for all data sizes. That means you could prototype your program on a small area of the world, and then you could just drop in the planet, and it would work the exact same way. You wouldn't have to do some kind of complicated hosted solution involving multiple computers. Um, and in general, um, small extracts or areas should be very fast. Um, huge ones should be possible, even on a simple laptop computer. Like you should not need, you know, like a server computer with 64 gigs of RAM to do like a planet scale operation. Um, and, but there's also some compromises. Um, so there's some non-goals I set out. Um, we don't want to be bound to like talking to this thing over a network. Um, we don't want to favor any map projection. People use OSM with different map projections, so we don't want to do everything in Web Mercator. Um, here's a big one. We don't really care about optimizing for storage space um, because uh, storage is actually pretty cheap right now. Um, a one terabyte SSD that's external is like $150. Um, if you're on um, a hosted service like Amazon, storage is pretty cheap compared to getting more RAM. Um, so I think that um, my design is kind of more towards performance and less towards saving space. Um, we also don't store OSA metadata right now, but I'll talk more about that later. Um, so new library, um, it's called OSM Express. Um, it defines a file format called the .osmx file. Um, and it has a C++ implementation of um, a program to read and write these files as well as update them. And right now there's also a Python library to read them. Um, and um, in general, like its design is to take advantage of really common libraries. Um, it uses LMDB, it uses a serialization library called Cap and Proto, and it uses S2 for indexing. Um, so I'm just gonna walk through um, some common use cases I've imagined um, for this new library. Um, one of them is if you want an offline, updatable, and also queryable planet on your laptop, totally offline, you should never have to re-download that weekly PBF um, and deal with that thing. Instead, you should just be able to consume a diff from uh, that server. Um, so just to demo, I'm gonna pop out of here. Um, I'm gonna show everyone my terminal. I hope I can make this big enough. Yeah, okay, so um, I have, um, is everyone able to see this? Um, so I have um, my external hard drive, which is one terabyte. Um, it's uh, pretty cheap, $150, I think, for these, um, like the Samsung T5. Um, this is not product placement. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it's great. Um, I highly recommend it. Um, so what I have on here is I have, um, Planet.osm.pbf, um, which is like 49 gigs, and also planet. Uh, also this Planet.osmx, which is um, this new format that is created from the PBF. Um, as you can see, it's actually really big. The entire planet is 570 gigs. Um, but the nice part about this format is um, I can run a script here um, that just points at that file on my external hard drive and right now it's scraping um, this planet.osm.org server and applying diffs. So each sequence number, if you're familiar, is one minute of changes, and each sequence number takes about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 seconds to apply. So it's pretty fast for applying these diffs. Um, I can also do things like um, use this command line tool called osmx, osmx query against that file with the uh, ways and a way ID, and that is exactly the building we're in. Um, so it shows you on that top line all of the node IDs that are a member of the way and also all the tags. Um, so that's sort of the most basic use case for just having an entirely offline copy of OSM. Let me... Um, so the next use... Yeah, um, so, so the next use case I want to talk about is um, an extract service. Um, so you might see online there's um, sites that have PBF downloads um, of regions, like Metro Extracts. Um, those are really great. Um, 
Uh, but one sort of um, drawback is that they're not really updated that frequently, uh, maybe like once a day or once a week. So it's not that great if you are, if you're doing edits um, and you want to consume those immediately without waiting until those refresh. Um, so I have a new site that's um, backed by OSM Express. Um, you can visit it at protomaps.com slash, uh, slash extracts. Um, just to demo what that looks like, um, I have it open in a browser here. Uh, we can zoom in on where we are right now in Minneapolis. Um, and maybe just get a little slice like that. Hit the Create button. And like I said, um, so the goal is for really small areas, it should be really fast. So that takes like four seconds to generate an extract of that entire area. That's like eight megabytes. Um, so um, this is all updated minutely. So if you made a change to OSM five minutes ago, that should be reflected in this. And it has a timestamp that's included. Uh, yeah. um, so there's also a Python library. Um, I'm not really a huge fan of showing code on slides, but this is short enough that I hope you get the point, which is um, in, if you're using Python or even something like an iPod, uh, um, an IPython notebook, you can just on the second line there open the file. Um, you need to create some classes, and then you can just do ways.get and the ID and then print out its coordinates and its tags. Um, and like I kind of imagine all this as being sort of low-level libraries. Um, one like big use case is if it's embedded, like you could write an application or tools for OpenStreetMap um, that just accesses all of OSM through this file. Um, so one example is like let's build the OSM API using this tool. Um, I'm going to switch back to my browser. Uh, so I wrote a little web server here. I think it's, I think it's here. Yeah. So it's just a little web server that points at the file, and that will give me a little user interface here. So all I'm doing here is I'm doing the same thing as I showed in Python or on the command line, but inside of a web server. Um, I can search the database by way, and I'm going to return that as GeoJSON. Um, so in this case, um, that's the building we're in. Um, that's really fast to query. It probably took like 0 0.01 seconds or something. You can see the way and all of its tags, um, the geometry, um, even something quite big, um, like this is the boundary relation for the state of Minnesota, um, should take maybe three or four seconds. I don't know why it's not working. Oh, thanks. Yep, OK. So that took like three seconds to generate. Um, that's like a lot of nodes. I think it's probably like in the tens of megabytes of data. So a lot of that time was just sent spending um, like time sending it over the wire. Um, so that's the idea behind um, this embedded usage. Um, so that gives, like, that gives you an idea of the use cases. Um, sort of the philosophy behind this is that OSM should be simple, or at least simpler than it is now. You should be able to prototype an application or a tool on a small extract and then extend that to the entire world and also update it all through something that is quite simple, does not involve you know, multiple web servers running. Um, I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about the implementation of this um, and why um, it's fast. Um, so the overview, it's actually really, really small. It's about 1,500 lines of code of C++. Um, it's available under a BSD2 clause license. My intention is to make it really easy to build a static build, for example, or even if you want to include it in like a commercial product. Um, it uses libosmium for reading and writing PDF files, um, which is a really great tool that I, that I really recommend. Um, storage, it's built around a storage engine called um, it's called LMDB. Um, it handles uh, most of the multi-process aspects of the database, um, which means you can have many processes that read from the file at the same time. You can even have one that is also writing to it at the same time. Um, it does have a lot of um, strong limitations. Um, 
especially compared to other sort of data storage engines in its class, like LevelDB. Um, so part of the work of making um, this work was to work around slow random writes. Um, it uses cap and proto um, as a serialization format, um, which is pretty similar to like protobufs if you use those. Um, but there's sort of a synergy between these two libraries in that records don't require any deserialization. So when you access a field, all you're doing is, all you're doing is accessing a pointer to virtual memory, um, which in most cases is really fast. Um, and the operating system handles all caching. So there's no code in um, this library to do like caching in memory. Um, th there is some drawbacks, like I mentioned. Um, the biggest one is storage space. Uh, there's no code in there that's about compression uh, because of that design. Um, there's also storage overhead in using Cabin Proto. Um, like all of your fields need to be have an address divisible by eight. Um, so that kind of spread things out a little bit. Um, so Planet ends up being more than half a terabyte. Um, but like I said, the good news is that storage is cheap. Um, you can also use this on a transparently compressed file system. Um, in the past few years, like ZFS and, um, and also ButterFS um, have become um, more popular, um, more widely deployed on especially managed services. Um, and it works well with, like, with those, uh, it works well with those file systems. So Planet becomes about 200 gigs on, I think on ZFS. Um, just to describe the file layout, um, so in an LMDB database, you have multiple sort of tables, um, and it's in total 10 tables. Um, you can kind of get an idea of locations, nodes, ways, and relations. Um, those store coordinates or tags. There's also tables in the other direction, so from a node to all the ways it belongs to, from a node to all the relations it belongs to, et cetera. Um, so how do we deal with spatial? Um, um, so spatial in general, I wanted to use a library that did not work in Web Mercator because a lot of consumers of the data are going to be projecting to something that's not Web Mercator. Um, so there's a library by Google called S2 Geometry. Um, it's for indexing nodes in spherical coordinates via 64-bit integers. So it breaks the world down into cells. Each cell has a 64-bit cell ID. Um, and these cells at each level have a resolution. Um, I chose for this one to do all the indexing at level 16, which is sort of a good trade-off between uh, speed and size. Um, and also, all, like all these queries are done via cell coverings, which are approximations. Um, in general, I think that's an okay trade-off for most users. Um, if your space um, that you're querying for is, is like approximate, you might get some stuff outside of it. You can always clip it afterwards. Um, just a visual demonstration of how this works. Um, I have a query area, which is Central Park in Manhattan, um, which is a pretty, sim like, is a pretty simple rectangle um, that can be broken down into cells of different levels. Um, at most, 16 um, is the smallest cell in that um, image. So you can kind of get an idea of a level 16 cells, like maybe one city block that has a couple hundred nodes. Um, and then from that covering, I can retrieve all of the OSM nodes and then all the ways that are referenced from there. Um, if you've worked with um, sort of the OSM data, like um, you'll see that the ways come outside, but that's because I'm making all the ways reference complete. Um, so you have a complete way there um, that kind of extends all the way out to the end. Um, but that's an example of how this covering works. Um, for a huge area, like this is a big part of Southeast Asia, um, you can see that um, it is approximated via a pretty small number of cells by using different levels. Um, so how that's stored in the database is that um, you're storing um, a map from that level 16 cell to all the nodes that belong in that cell. So the spatial indexing is done only over nodes. Um, in general, the performance um, is pretty good. Um, creating the planet.osmx from a PBF file still takes about six hours on like a desktop computer. Um, the performance uh, really depends on how fast your hard drive is. Um, but for queries or extracts that take more than 30 minutes, in general, using Osmium tool is faster. Um, I did some benchmarking. Um, I figured that um, on the x-axis is how many nodes are in your extract on the y-axis is how many minutes it takes. So because Osmium will always do one pass through the entire file, it takes about 30 minutes on my laptop. Um, if you use OSMX extract, then 
Small areas are really fast, but once you get above about 150 million nodes, um, it's faster just to use Osmium. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, alternate like sort of designs. Um, one thing people ask me about is, can you index ways instead of just nodes? Um, so for example, if you have like this way or relation that is a line string, you can find all the cells. Um, this is something I've explored a bit. Um, it could make certain queries faster if you only care about ways. You don't have to go through nodes to get there. Um, it is tricky though, because you need to interpret if like um, a way is an area or just a linear feature. Um, so like, for example, like this huge one that is a, like on the East Coast um, that I came up with, like there's a large difference between if you index it as an area or, in, or as a way like the area is going to encompass a huge area there while the way is only going to be a small number of cells going up. Um, yeah, so there is some alternate designs um, that might be able to be like optional or like enhancements um, to the file format. Um, it is expensive to compute these coverings, especially if you're doing all the ways that might have, um, that might be very large. Boundary, um, those boundary relations like for countries are just huge. Um, so calculating like a covering for a boundary relation might take like minutes. Um, there's some tricks that you can do related to like if a relation has subrelations, you can cache the covering for subrelations. But in general, like all these like make the code like twice as complicated as it is. So I'm trying to like keep it simple with this library. Um, in conclusion, um, so the overall goal that was achieved is to try to discover the simplest possible storage format that supports random access, spatial indexing, and also fast updates. Um, in the long term, um, I think this could be used as sort of a base layer to build like an ecosystem of tools on top of OSM. If you're doing anything that requires sort of analytics about change sets um, or like um, that are ways being created in a certain area, um, this might be really useful. Um, Further development, um, like I said, um, there's a link at the bottom to GitHub. Try it out. Um, I just open sourced it last week. Um, it can make your tools, your production environment simpler. Um, tell me if you find bugs, open pull requests, um, or if you want better documentation. Um, that's something I'm working on. There's also a really great uh, Slack channel on the OSM US Slack um, called um, hashtag dev. Um, and I've been talking in there a bit about like the overall design. Um, and also contact me if you're interested or if you think there is something that should be supported or if there's um, some way that you're wondering if it's a good fit for your use case. Um, so my email is included. All right, great, thank you. I have uh, six minutes for questions, so I should be able to take plenty of questions. Yeah, uh, he's coming with a mic. So I'm curious about the database format and the incremental updates. So is it efficient to just indefinitely continue applying incremental updates, or at some point would you want to rebuild from the planet a uh, fresh file? Um, that's something that I think that it should be fine to always be incrementally updating it. There is some um, subtle issues where um, I'm aware of some issues with the design where if you have like a long running write transaction that can, um, that means that pages won't be reused. So it's like, um, if you are doing lots of writes, um, then the, I think if you're doing lots of writes, the space of the database will always grow. But as long as you're not doing writes, it's pretty good at reusing space. Um, it's something I'm experimenting with, um, but um, I think it should be fine um, for incrementally updating indefinitely. Um, it's just like storage space, you need to have a lot of it. Yeah. Um, you said something about metadata and that, uh, that you're not storing metadata right now, but you have some ideas. Oh, right. Um, I forgot to mention that. Yeah. So after talking with Seth, um, so the question was storing metadata. Um, the issue with metadata is it makes the database even larger especially for nodes. Um, a node in general, like most nodes don't have any tags. They're just locations. So you can store them really compactly. However, those nodes have version numbers and also user IDs and change the IDs as well as timestamps. Um, 
So originally, I just left off metadata completely. Um, after talking with Seth this weekend, I'm like, if we ignore untagged nodes, we might be able to get away with adding, like, I guess, most metadata for most objects pretty efficiently. Um, so it's something I'm experimenting with, and I think it might expand the use cases a lot. Um, is everything in the library uh, single-threaded? Yeah, um, it's completely single-threaded. Um, so you can build an application on top of it that um, spawns multiple threads. Each thread will need its own transaction. Um, but in general, um, it's pretty good at like being multi-process. Um, impressive technology. Can you uh, query for um, a text-based query on uh, name or attribution or um, a timestamp? It doesn't have any sophisticated indexing except for spatial. So if you're going to query um, on a tag or something like uh, the username, uh, you would sort of have to do a scan over all the objects. Um, there is a lot of use cases. Um, that sounds like one in which overpass might still be better um, because it is quite a bit more sophisticated in how it handles like tag indexes. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> this one here. Just to follow up on the tags, do you have that on your roadmap, or is that something that like could be possible in the future? I think it could be possible. Um, you could, for example, generate a bitmap. Or you could, if you know in advance that you only want to query, let's say, um, objects that are highway equals something, you could in advance build um, an index um, and then be able to query over that. Um, the issue is kind of um, every use case is going to be quite specific about what it needs. Um, so I'm right now I'm focused on the more general purpose case. And for those specialized use cases, you could use this as one component and then build some indexing on top of it. One more question. Hi, thank you. So uh, when you're making the OSMX file from the PBF, uh, can you filter by tags and whatnot? Um, it's something I've thought about adding. Um, right now, it works perfectly fine if you first use Osmium tool to filter the PBF file and then import that into an OSMX. So the end result's kind of the same, and I think um, like people like the Osmium tool tooling anyways, so like you're able to achieve the same thing that way, yes. I think it's time for lunch.